Welcome back to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. It's episode 78, episode 6 of season 4. Wow, the, 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 the episodes are just slipping by. And um, Steve, it's a great pleasure to introduce us to uh, our guest this week. Um, former Melbourne Victory defender, ex soccer and, well, we'll count him as one of our own, a Geelong boy, Adrian oh, Leia. Ado, great to have you on the show. How are you? Good evening, gents. I'm well. How are you guys? Oh, absolutely yeah. fantastic, fantastic, mate. Absolutely fantastic. And what about yourself? Loving life down on the surf coast? Oh, yeah, I am. I am. I'm, uh, <laughs> I've slotted right back into the Janjuk life, enjoying the, uh, the salt water. But I'm, as we speak, I'm actually in Canberra up here for the uh, Matildas versus New Zealand game. So uh, a couple of days away. Oh, I couldn't, couldn't be any more different to uh, Torquay. Couldn't be. Actually, I was down Torquay way <laughs> yesterday. It was absolutely beautiful. It was really warm. And then today was a little bit cold on the training track, but no doubt... Um, you're pretty rugged up up there in um, in Canberra, although indoors you'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's not too bad. It's actually been nice out there today, and uh, as you said, a lovely weekend in Torquay. And uh, yeah, I, I sort of I don't mind it when it starts getting a bit colder because the waves start coming, and, and hopefully they do get some good ones for the uh, Repeal Pro. Well, they say yeah, uh, you, know, exactly. you know you're a Victorian because all you do is you start every conversation with the weather, and we indeed have started with the weather. But let's talk about more important <laughs> things. <laughs> more important things. Let's talk about football. As Bill Shankly said, football is not a matter of life or death. It's more important than that. But, um, uh, Ada, let's talk about your career, first of all. Um, and, and you came to Geelong. Um, you actually weren't born in Geelong. Um, you are born in New South Wales, but then you mo- your family moved to Geelong. Tell us about, you know, going back right to the start. Um, how did you get involved in playing football? Um, and not say rugby or AFL or anything like that, but the real football. And, uh, and, 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 and what sort of, what were those main influences in your life early in the piece? Yeah, so, I mean, I grew up in Dubbo in the country in New South Wales. So uh, it was either rugby league or, or the real football, as you call it. Um, <laughs> and... So I think the the choice was pretty obvious from that point. Um, my mum, my mum is born and bred English. My dad is born and bred Dutch. So it's uh, it is in the blood. And um, my my dad was actually coaching my brother's under six team. And I think I annoyed uh, the pair of them enough to to you know get out there and have a run around. So <laughs> I suppose you know looking back, I probably played most of my football up um, with my brother and his mates, and and that probably helped me. Um, mm in the long run with my development and you know once I got to rep football it was almost you know that's probably why I got thrown in the back earlier because I was kind of bigger and been used to playing around with the bigger boys so um look I had a a great um upbringing in Dubbo it was it was all about you know sport 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 do as much as you can and I played every sport but um football was the one that I suppose I stuck with and and I had a unfortunately I did and uh, as a young uh, teenager, you went on to do pretty well getting into the VIS and then debuting at the uh, Melbourne Knights at a young age. But uh, what are your memories from those sort of teenage years of playing football and coming through the ranks and, uh, and, and playing maybe a few games in Geelong before that happened as well? Yeah, um, as you can see there, those photos are probably my <laughs> debut, maybe. Um, yeah. I think I, think I was... Uh, I, I remember a youngster I said, there. 75 kilos um, making my debut there and I, I remember I played against Joe Spateri in my first game and you know for me it was it, it was a, it was a big big moment um, and you know it, it had been a lot of sacrifice and hard work growing up and a lot of time in the car and um, you know up and down the freeway from Geelong to Melbourne once we moved down and um, yeah. you know those those things you never forget, and especially your debut, and, and that was a, a time in my life which you know I, I absolutely love my time at Melbourne Knights. It was um, it was just an incredible environment. I love the the culture and the history of that club and, and the the players that have been through that club. And although I was only there for twelve months, um, when I retired, it was probably one of my fondest memories. So um, look, I, I had a I had a fortunate career, but you know, starting out as a seventeen year old in the NSL was a, it was a pretty good introduction to the game and a good introduction in terms of being the youngest in the dressing room and uh being taught a few lessons and you, you quickly then moved on to to melbourne victory the uh so the nsl um finished up and then there was a bit of a, a break there and then um i think in 2005 was it that that the a-league started you were right there from the outset with uh, melbourne victory 
had a few of the Melbourne Knights players come over from the Knights. Roddy Vargas was one that I can remember. Um, mate, tell us what what was it like then being involved in a in a in a competition that was absolutely brand new. That was you know um, there was so much being built, so much excitement. It was um, it was you know it was part of the mainstream. What were you what what was your recollections of, of those experiences in those first few years of the A League? Yeah, it was actually it was actually quite scary to be honest. Um, you know, I'd, I'd made my mark in the NSL and and I went to Knights because I thought I'd get more game time and ended up playing twenty one games or something like that. And um, then the league paused for a really long period, and we had under twenties mm-hmm. matches, and we just weren't fit. We didn't we didn't have the training. We missed a really big chunk of football, um, and really didn't know what to expect, but. You know, then you, you sort of fast forward and, and you look at Olympic Park and the first couple of games there were sellouts. And, you know, I think by about round eight or nine, we, we, we beat Sydney at home 5-0 and, and looked like we were going to go and, and run away with the championship. But, um, you know, that season turned on its head and we, we ended up finishing second last. Um, but then it was the year after. It was, it was when, you know, we made the move to Telstra Dome and at the time it was Telstra Dome, um, which, again, I was a bit apprehensive about and I thought, we're not going to be able to feel this. And, you know, sure enough, the next thing we're playing in front of 40, 45,000 and, and the place is absolutely rocking. And, mm. you know, to be able to do that in your home town, um, in front of your family and friends every week was, was something I never, ever, ever thought would be possible in this country. And, um, you know, pretty special times. Yeah, it was pretty incredible, like 55,000 people at that 2007 uh, grand final. It must have been amazing being out there uh, at that time. And then it must have given you a good experience and confidence for when you ended up making the move over to uh, to Fulham, who were in, at the time in the Premier League. Yeah, it actually, in, in some ways, it made it harder because I, I was used to playing in front of 50,000 people. And then, oh. you know, as a, I think I was 21 when I left, I, I got there and... Um, you know, I was into the reserve team and I was playing in front of 200 people. Yeah. Um, and I found that really challenging because I was the type of player that needed that, you know, that energy around me. And, and, and I'd always live for the bigger occasions and the bigger games. And, you know, I look back at my career and my best games were the big ones. Um, so, you know, going to, to England and playing on a, on a Wednesday night with, uh, you know, temporary flood, floodlights and on the training pitch was, was tough. Um, but, you know, that experience as well as, as of being at Fulham and then being at Norwich, um, you know, I learn a hell of a lot there in terms of football and the training required and the standards required to, you know, have a long career. And I think that that probably helped me sort of towards the back end of my career. Mate, then you, you had a stint in, um, in in Asia as well. Sue on there, there's a photo of you just joining the, the mob there. Um, contrast your experiences or contrast the football that you experienced in, in, in Europe to that of Asia, I mean, obviously we would we would imagine it's 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 completely different, but um, on you know levels of professionalism, the crowd interaction, all of that. How how did you um see the two kind of experiences in your eyes? Yeah, I mean, you know, Europe's Europe, Europe's Europe's just different level, and even now I, I sort of sit here and I'm working in football, and and I just sometimes think, gee, how good would it be if, if we had that on our doorstep? Um, but you know, I went, I left Melbourne Victory 2014 when we were on the verge of winning the championship and I knew we were going to win it, but I had an offer to go to China, which I just couldn't refuse and, and I, it, it broke my heart to leave. But, um, you know, I did, did what I had to do for my family at the time. And um, the professionalism is even going from, from you know, Melbourne Victory where, you know, it's an elite club, an elite environment, um, elite coaching and you know, tactically we were under Ange and, and then Muskie, um, you know, two of the best coaches I've played under. Um, going to China was, it was like going back 15 years. Um, <laughs> and and that's, that's no disrespect to them, but the, the, the facilities and everything just, just weren't to the standard that, that they should have been, especially with the amount of money that was going around in the league at the time. Um, fast forward 12 months and, and, and my contract in, in China ended and I, I was presented an opportunity to go to Korea and that was, you know, it was a point in my career where I was ready for that. I was, I was ready for a different experience, but an incredible experience and, and, a, and a moment of my life that I, I really appreciate. And our family had an amazing time there. We, we, um, we lived not far out of Seoul. We loved the food. We loved the people. Um, the football was very, very tough. 
Um, the preseason was very tough and it was tough on our family. But, you know, I look back and, and, and I really value that time, particularly in South Korea. It was just such an amazing place to live. Oh, wow. Um, and what about your memories, uh, Adrian, from your time with the, the national team squads? You're involved in the national team at all age groups up to uh, even up to the Socceroos where you've got yourself a Socceroos cap and you were even uh, picked by by Aussie Goose to uh, train with the squad as well before 2006, but also uh, 2008 Olympics as well? Yeah. Um, look, I, I think... You know, everyone has a bit of a journey, and I suppose for me, the the under seventeens, um, you know, I had to fight pretty hard to get into that team, and, and ended up going away and, and and playing every game and, and doing quite well. And that's probably, you know, off the back of that, I signed at, at Melbourne Knights and probably made a little bit of a a name for myself. Um, you know, and then I think we had the under twenties in in Holland. Um, again, amazing experiences and and and. You know things you do and places you go and teams you play against players you play against that you just you wouldn't have dreamed of and um you know and then the beijing 2008 was again an incredible experience and i think for me unfortunately at the at the games i i was replaced by jade north as he was an overage player um which which gutted me but um you know i played in every single qualifier and got us there um and that was countries like jordan north korea um Lebanon, um, just places you'd never even go and, and, and some of the memories and, you know, it, it's, everyone thinks you're this footballer and it's all, you know, easy and perfect, but it was bloody yeah. hard. And, yeah. and um, you know, we had, to, we had to work hard. I'd often fly back from the UK to these sorts of countries or back to Australia and, and play the next day. And, um, you know, really, really good experiences, but, but a lot of hard work. Yeah. Now you were a fan favourite um, um, at the victory. Um, there's a photo of you. <laughs> well, there's a photo. Well, certainly amongst the younger, younger <laughs> crew, that's for sure. There's a, there's a good photo there of you. It must have been a, a, a clinic or something like that. In fact, that's probably in July. I can see the K Rock band in the back in the background there. Um, and that I guess that that set you up well for for a life post football, where you're now um, coaching the kids. Mate, is that something that even before you finished uh, your football career, is that something that you kind of knew that was the direction you wanted to go um, because you now are the, the franchise uh, franchisee of Curva Coaching here in Geelong? Or is that something that happened a little bit later on after you finished and you sort of started getting itchy feet and wanted to get back involved in, uh, in, in football? T talk us through that process. To be completely honest, it was my daughter that made me do it. Um, oh, it's the kids, isn't it? They're the ones the to kids. blame always. Yep. <laughs> so, so initially, when I got out of football, I just wanted a break. I was like, I just need some time just away from it. Um, and then my daughter, she, she, I'd always sort of try and get her involved or want to have a kick or whatever. She wasn't interested. And one day, out of the blue, she said, Dad, I want to play football, but you have to be my coach. Um, and I said, right, let's do it. So I, I literally rang um, the ex-Surf Coast president, I think on the way home in the car and said, I'm going to start a team. What do I have to do? Um, before we knew it, we had sort of six or seven of, of her schoolmates signed up and, and that's grown to, to now. I think there's about, I think there's 24 under nine yeah. girls. And yep. I reckon 19 have come from her sort of immediate school group. Um, so that's like, it's, it's just the best thing ever. You know what it's like, Tonchi coaching your kids and being around that environment. It's, it's absolutely. Mate, I've got a ever. very, very similar experience. No, I haven't represented the soccerers and I haven't played in Europe and South Korea, but I had a break of about 10 years running my own business and this and that and not being involved with soccer. And it was exactly like that through my own daughter. And, and it's funny. I mean, I don't want to talk about myself too much. We're talking about you, Ada. But it was purely mis by mistake. We wanted to get her involved. She's about three or four at the time. And you quickly got that itch to get back involved. And one thing led to another. Started working for Football Victoria. Started coaching. Started, and look at this. Now we're running a podcast, Steve and I. But it's it's amazing how <laughs> things happen. <laughs> yeah, it's it's it, exactly. It's it's amazing how things sort of accidentally fall into place. But, you know, you've got a, a curve of coaching uh um, uh, school now or franchise tell us how, how that's come about yeah so again as you just said with your story mine's really similar um, I basically had a, had a few 
friends sort of reach out and say, are you doing any sort of one-on-one coaching? Would you do any extra coaching and things like that? And, and through my work with Adidas, I work in sports marketing with Adidas. Um, we're a global partner with Curver and I actually, you know, do all the product ordering for, for the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just got chatting to, to Jason, who's the, the Asia Pacific um, director. And I said, like, what do you reckon? Do you reckon I could do one of these down my way? And um, one thing led to another. And, and before I, I knew it, I was up in Canberra doing all the training and, um, you know, preparing to go on this little journey. And it's, um, I love it. It's, it's, a, it's a really good program and probably the only one that I ever, that I wanted to get involved with because I think it's really genuine. Um, and yeah, we, we, we started in, in term one this year. We've got quite a few kids coming through it now and, um, and hopefully we'll continue to grow. Adrian, what do you think is the understanding of COVID coaching across the football community in Australia with uh, parents and kids? Do you think it's something that is as well known or well renowned as it should be in Australia? Are people um, familiar with it or are they still, uh, is it still something they think is from left field a little bit? Yeah, look, I think if you know football, you know it, definitely. Um, it's uh, And that's, I suppose, especially where I'm running it down the surf coast where football, you wouldn't say, is the number one sport. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, for me growing up, it was it was massive, especially in that sort of, that era of, of, of my time. Um, and that's one of the other reasons why I want to do it, because I know if I did it, I'd be, I would have been a heaps better player. Um, technically, I was quite poor, um, as some of those fans might say, Tonchi, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, we loved it because you were uh, one we've of got our your own. biggest. He's we've got your biggest fan in the comments, Santino, and his uh, his oh, pump yeah. that you're on the show. Oh, yeah, good. Look, I gave him everything, and that's all we can ask for. But I think, to be brutally brutally honest, and Stephen Lustiger will, will back this up by doing this sort of program. Technically, you you become a much better player, and um, and that's part of the reason why I thought, you know what, this is perfect for the Geelong region. Um, mm-hmm. The kids will benefit from it. And it's, 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 it's a love for me and it's a passion for me and, and hopefully I can turn it into a, you know, a, a nice little sort of movement down that way. When, when I was working at Football Victoria and responsible for the Geelong region, along with Foddy Kipri, and big shout out to Foddy, who's like the godfather of, of, of football here in Geelong. For, for, we, we spoke with, um, uh, I think he was then the, the North Geelong Warriors technical director, Igor Serbinovsky, who was looking at, creating his own thing. And we said in Geelong, the big vacuum is that nine to 13 year olds to get their technical ability up to really, really improve them. Um, And that was what, 2017, thereabouts, 2018. Fast forward four years and we've got a lot of those academies now popping up because there was always that appetite. There was, And I I I know quite a fair few people who are willing to take their kids all the way down to Melbourne, one-on-one coaching, um, um, you know, specialist coaching, and it's all got to do with that technical element. We just don't seem to have or haven't had that level of coaching. And look, I know speaking to Stephen um, off camera, he used to say growing up in Canberra, um, they weren't able to do a lot of things in training. So a lot of the technical side, because you, know, you do a drill and play a game and that's about it. Or you've got a, you know, a volunteer dad looking after the kids. Some of this specialist coaching was oh so important in the development of of technical skills and in his case as well. So and we've got Stephen coming up; he can tell you all himself his own experiences. But are you starting to see, even the short time that you've been here, the level of skill in, in a lot of your students, a lot of your pupils, the technical skill just improving out of sight because they're focusing on that? Yeah, heaps, and I think there's a there is a little bit of a you know, misconception as well that it's all, you know, you with the ball and trying to do tricks and things like that. But it's, it's not about that. The, the, the program has evolved a lot, um, a lot of 1v1, a lot of 2v2. Yep. The, way, the, way, the way I try to explain it is the way that the sessions are set up is for the, for the kids to explore and learn themselves in certain situations. So, you know, it's a lot of multi-goal. It's a lot, you know, getting their head up, changing direction, doing it naturally. And, and, and that's, that's all they need. They just need to learn naturally and they need to spend time on the pitch. And like, I've got some girls in our group who I just, I just love watching them play. Um, you know, one of them the other day did a double step over against me and beat me and just ran straight past me. And it was like <laughs> the best thing ever. I just wanted to stop and stop <laughs> um, But, and, and then, and then even, you know, like I've done a, I've done a group on a Wednesday night, mainly surf coast kids and, and, and some of them, 
I've just seen an incredible amount of improvement in them because I feel like they haven't had that sort of coaching mm -hmm. um, for a long time. And it's it's um, it's exciting and it's it's nice to, to see that improvement. You get, a, as you'd know, Tonch, you get an immense amount of satisfaction when you see it in the kids and see how, you know, how happy they are. And, you know, I run a three to six program too, and it's not all about this whole technical improvement. It's just about getting a ball at your feet fun. and having mm -hmm. fun and um, creating a good environment. And that's all it is. Well, now, uh, Adrian, since you finished playing, uh, finished up at Dandy City there in that team that was a bit of an A-League All-Stars with, uh, I think you had Santa Lab and, and Carl Valeri, and I'm not sure if Mate Duganzic had finished up at Dandy City by that time or not, but certainly some big names in, the, in that squad. Um, you, you wrapped up playing football, but then you, I'm hearing you have had a run with some old fellas uh, this uh, summer, maybe once or twice, and uh, did you pull out any of these skills uh, playing reportedly as a midfielder in the Masters Summer League? Well, I told him I wasn't going anywhere near the back line. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually ended up my first game. Actually, I think it was about thirty-five degrees. I ended up in yep. the in the forward line. We were two all with I think the team that finished top. I got played in one on one with by my brother. Um, one on one with the keeper, and I put it wide. So um, I sort of haven't lived that one down and didn't go up front again. But I oh, look, it was more some of my brother's mates from school that put together this group, and um, just you know a lot of old fellows who. To be honest, it was more about the beer afterwards, uh, <laughs> and, and the team. The team was pretty relaxed. We didn't really fight for too much. We won one game, and uh, as you said, I only played two, so it's <laughs> pretty short lived. But I, I might put boots on again next year. Well, if you have no idea what Ado and Steve are talking about, the Master Summer League, which is now finished, it was an absolute brilliant concept. And uh, go back into our YouTube channel. We mentioned our YouTube channel. It was episode two or episode 74, we had um, a guy from Brewery Colo there, Chiller from Brewery Colo. He was the sponsor um, telling us all about the uh, the beer, the famous beer after the games. And uh, we also had Simon Blanche and Ross Abraham from the organisers as well. So, look, um, fantastic. Um, we're talking with Adrian Leia about Curva Coaching. And, Adrian, there's a clinic coming up um, after Easter. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll also talk about your special guest that you've got um, um, helping you out on that clinic, um, Stephen Lustitzer, who is currently with uh, Western United and doing really well. But we're going to take a little bit of a break, and when we return, we're going to continue this uh, this uh, riveting conversation. Thank you with um, Adrian Leia. Well, back on the Geelong Region a Soccer Show, we will be going a little bit over time, I think, tonight, Steve. We've had such a great conversation here, and we still haven't got our next guest yet. But, um, Adrian, before we go any further, uh, tell us all about the clinic, the um, school holiday clinic that is coming up um, next week, I think it is. Yeah, so it's in the second half of, of, of the Easter holidays. Um, we're running it out of Geelong College Middle School, which is awesome. It's a... You know, I walk onto their their pictures, and it just reminds me of the, you know, the good old days and the, the nice clean cut grass. So um, we're, mm -hmm. we're doing a three to six year old clinic from from nine till ten each day, and then the mm -hmm. I suppose the main clinic um, between ten thirty and one thirty each day. Um, we will have a half an hour lunch break in between on the on the with the main clinic. Um, yep. And that's where you know the likes of Stephen Lustica, um, Amy Amy Jackson, who's a who's who's just won her. Yeah, Second, she's a star, a, superstar. Yeah, superstar. Oh, wow. So yep. she, she's 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 going to be one of our specialist coaches for the whole three days. Um, oh wow! So yeah, there's a good little good little group there. We got. I'm really mindful about the coaches we bring in, and um, you know we should we should put on a great clinic for the kids. 
Oh, that is that is awesome. So there you go. So on April 20, which is next Wednesday, April 20, 21 and 22. So parents, if you want to have your kids, if they're bored by, by week two of the school holidays, they're going to be absolutely bored. They'll be jumping off walls. They'll be looking to burn some extra energy if they're aged between three and six. Yeah, there you go, between nine and 10 o'clock. What a, what a great time that is. Get them up nice and early. Um, they'll be running around. They'll be ready for an afternoon nap after that, I think, Ado. And <laughs> and then um, the seven to 16-year-olds from 10.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. There's all the details, www.curva.com.au. The email address is geelong at curva.com.au. And the phone number is 0423 975 569. Um, all the details are there. Uh, now, we're hoping to get Stephen Lushtitzer on if he's around. He's uh, We're still waiting for him to get into the green room. He uh, seems to be having some problems with his uh, camera at the moment. But as soon as we get him on board, we're going to to to, to uh, have a chat with uh, Stephen. Adrian, how did you get how did you get Stephen and Amy and some of these other guys onto your show? Onto your yeah, off show, but yeah. So I, I will just say, um, Tonch, the the seven to sixteen year old group is probably there's probably. I'd say there'd be lucky to be 10 spots left. I've capped it wow. um, to, to make sure it's, you, you know, reasonably, um, you know, small. Um, and yeah. so I just don't want people to be disappointed, but there's there's quite a few spots left for the three to six-year-olds. So um, in terms of getting Amy and and, and uh, Stephen on board, um, I'm actually, you know, playing with Melbourne Victory and obviously Amy's done really well there. And, and, and I see her as a, I suppose, a legend of the club. Um, you know, back-to-back -back championships and, 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 a, and a long history of the club. Um, so I had a friendship with her from my days at Melbourne Victory, but also it was funny. She played in, in South Korea while I was there, and um, I think she actually came over to our place for dinner one night and um, used to catch up and share our uh, our South Korean stories, which you need to do when you when you live over there. Yeah. So um, yeah. it's, uh, look, it's, and then, you know, obviously Stephen just through, through playing against him, um, you know, I, I do look after him with, with his uh, with that Adidas boots, um, you know, for, for, for use in the A League. So um, I, I do have a relationship with him from that too. So it's all just just worked out nicely. And I think I think it's great for the kids. It gives the kids. I, I remember when I was a kid, and you got I had NSL players coming to town, and I didn't know who they were, but I was like, oh, he's an NSL player. This is the best thing ever. Get an autograph mm -hmm. and a photo, and and, it, and it, it inspires you to go and do something. So it's yeah. um, it's good for the kids. All right. Well, we, we've we've got um Stephen Lustica, who is uh he's a bona fide um superstar himself. He plays for Western United, and it is an absolute pleasure to have Stephen on the uh, Geelong Region Soccer Show. He's making his debut on the Geelong Region Soccer Show. Stephen, uh, very warm welcome to you, and and thank you for being a part of our show tonight. No worries, guys. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming on, Steve. Well, let's go straight into talking about call for coaching. And you are a youngster, a little little uh knee high to a grasshopper footballer running around in Canberra. What are your memories of uh, learning Corva coaching skills uh, from a young age? Yeah, look, obviously um, I went through the program. Um, I think it was about maybe 10 or 11 years old when I started it. Um, and it was pretty, um, I was obviously grew up in Canberra and did all my junior football there. And, mm -hmm. you know, at that time when I was going growing up and, and, and started to play football, there was really no, no real, you know, other than our club training and, you know, luckily I had my father as well that played the game and he sort of, you know, taught me a lot. But other than, you know, your sort of club training, there was nothing really else out there. And then Curva came along in Canberra um, and really that was, you know, taught me a lot, to be honest. If it wasn't for Curva, um, I mean, there was no real other, other than, you know, my father teaching me football. There was, there was nothing else out there. And to be honest, Curva was a massive part of my development. Now, Stephen, speaking of your father, who I know very well personally, a big shout out to Bernie. Um, he's managed to uh, find some uh, photos of you from your younger years. And uh, he tells me you were about aged 11 at the time. Well, what a yeah. cute little photo there is. <laughs> what was yeah. that? What was, the, what was that? At? Like there's a big, obviously, um, you've got the Australian kit on there. And um, there's some uh, kids there that are definitely a lot taller than you. They probably would have been 12 or 13. <laughs> So um, tell us, was that was that an overseas trip that you were involved in as part of the Curva Curva Academy? 
Yeah, that that picture on the left, I um, in that trophy room, that was in Barcelona. So we went on an overseas trip to Barcelona. I'm pretty sure that was in uh, the new camp. That that photo, hundred yeah. percent, that one was at the new camp. Um, yeah. So yeah, there was a lot of overseas trips that we went on. Um, we went on. I think on that tour, we went to Barcelona, France. There was another tour we went to America and and Canada. Um, that photo on the right there, where we're in the Australian gear, that was um, that was I think that was on the Gold Coast. Um, that was in January. They used to have every January. There was like all the different curva from all around Australia will come together and do a, do a camp and then players will be selected to go on, go on the tours. So so that was um, on the Gold Coast, that picture there. So yeah, look, like I said, um, curva was was a massive part of my development. And, you know, I learned I, I learned all my, you know, all, all my skills through curva, all my technique, all the ball masteries, um, juggling, you know, just touches on the ball, technique, being comfortable on the ball. Um, it was all through the curva program. Now, uh, Steve, your your technical skills were uh, so good that you you ended up uh, going and representing one of the top clubs in the, one of the most one of the more technical leagues in Europe, and that's uh, Tonchi's favourite team, Hajduk Split. Oh, yes. Um, and you made your debut against uh, Barcelona. Do you want to tell us a bit more about your memories from Hajduk Split and that particular night as well? Yeah. Look, um, obviously, yeah, that was an unbelievable night. Um, you know, I went overseas. I think I was, I was 19, 20 years old when I signed in Croatia for Hajduk Split. Um, and growing up, that was you know a team that I've always supported. Um, you know, got got a family background there. Um, you know, my um, a former our cousin of mine was a club legend there. Um, so there's there's a bit of history there with, with with my surname. So growing up, it was always the, the club that I supported. So you know, going there to be able to play and, and sign for them at such a young age was obviously a dream come true for me. And and then to make my debut against Barcelona was, was incredible as well. So um, you know, it was it was an incredible time and something that I'll never forget. Now, talking about the European trip, um, we, we spoke to Adrian just about his own experiences in Europe and in Asia. And there's obviously so many things like cultural differences you have to overcome, you know, being away from home and all of that kind of stuff. But I guess one of the things when you're moving to another country, particularly somewhere like Europe, is you've got to get used to the technical superiority of a lot of the players that have been playing and training since they've been since they've been, you know, not knee high to a grasshopper, and they obviously in Europe they train five days a week, six days a week, and what you're not. How important was it for you to have that background in the technical um, learning, the the development that Curva provided you when you went overseas to Europe? Yeah, definitely. Look, you know, what helped me a lot was, like I said, we went on a lot of overseas overseas tours as well with Curva, so. You know, when we went to Barcelona, we played against Barcelona under 13s, under 14s, and you know we, we really got a good indication where we were at when we played them. I remember we uh, played, I think in my own age group, we lost like eight nil, and then I played mm -hmm. played for the age group up, we lost like 16 nil. It was crazy, um, just to see the the, the the level, you know, and that obviously helped. You know, when, when you came back to Australia, you realise like how far you how far away you are um, to to reach that level. So. Um, those experiences through Curva coaching and you know just all those years of of, of following a program and, and and a lot of it was um, going home and there was a lot of homework involved with Curva as well. It wasn't just turning up to the training sessions and, and doing the you know two three times a week training. There was a lot of um, homework involved there as well. We had our own diary and we, you know we had to do you know certain targets every day. We had to practice our skills, juggling. We had to get records. So and we always had to hand, hand in our diaries at the end of the week. Um, so there was a lot of you know, obviously, we, we, we did the sessions um, with our squad with Curva, but then in your own time, it was how much time you put in as well, um, away from the sessions that, that really you benef benefited from as well. Um, and, yeah, again, those uh, touching on those skills that you developed from that, that technique and I guess those hours and rep repetition and that sort of thing as well, it's given you that uh, that skill base to be to be the great player that you've uh, become and a great technical player. How do you find it in terms of the versatility that that enables you, like particularly with your current club, Western United, where you're able to play in that midfield role as potentially a 6, 8 or a 10? Does, do you think Corvo is something that gives players a lot of versatility? 100%. You know, ultimately, it, 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 it allows you to become comfortable with the ball. Um, and if you're comfortable on the ball and with the ball and your technique's good, you can you can obviously play in a lot of different roles. Um, so, you know, if your technique's limited and your skills are limited, then obviously you can have limited um, 
you know, ability on the field and, and, you know, you'll be restricted as well. So what Curva does allow you to do is obviously, you know, um, you know, it gives you that ability to obviously, you know, be able to be adaptable and most of all be comfortable, comfortable in all, in all situations. So that's definitely, that's something that helped me um, along my journey was mm -hmm. to be comfortable on the ball and, and have that, you know, confidence to be able to, you know, receive the ball, um, you know, be under pressure, a lot of 1v1s, 2v2s, um, like Ado touched on before. It's a lot of those small sided games that Curva concentrated on, um, especially when I was doing it as well. There's a lot of 1v1s, 2v2s, small sided games. Um, so, in, you know, in those restricted areas, um, allows you to become comfortable. Guys, um, I guess it's past nine o'clock, so most school kids would be in bed by now. But it is the school holidays, so no doubt we've got a lot of kids uh, tuning in. Ado, first of all to you, if you had to give these young kids here in Geelong um, and, and wherever else they're listening in, um, a, a word of advice as to if they wanted to become a professional footballer, what are some of the things they would have to do or not do um, in your eyes from your own experiences? Yeah, look, I think from my experience, I suppose I, I was a lot different from that to, to Stephen. Um, you know, I was a centre back and um, you know, very different type of player. But for me, I had to make a heap of sacrifices. I had to, I had to do everything right off the pitch um, to give myself a chance on the pitch. And um, you know, that started from the age of 13, 14, 15. I remember rocking up to games in Geelong, and boys, my teammates had been. You know, out the night before or mm -hmm. you know laughing at the parties and chasing girls and all that sort of thing and and i always you know i, I would have had a my same pre match meal i would have gone a bit earlier would have done all those things and yes yeah, it sounds pretty boring but it's just what you have to do to, to have half a chance and um the ones that are prepared to do it are the ones that you know are more more likely than not to to actually achieve something Steve, what about yourself? Um, um, we've heard from Adrian how he talks about sacrifices that have to be made. Um, what you know, you went overseas at a really young age, um, broke into a, a, a top European side at the age of nineteen. So, what what did you have to do? Um, what, or what would be your words of advice for any budding young professionals or wannabe professionals? Yeah, hundred percent. Like Ada just touched on, for me as well, it was all always about discipline, dedication, professionalism, and you know, to this day as well, I'm very, very strict with that as well. I mean, you know, there's obviously the technical side and all that, but you know, if you don't have the other side, whereas you got to be disciplined, you got to be professional, you got to look after your body, um, all that kind of stuff. You know, you you, you won't be able to um, sustain a career in football, um, especially the way the game's going at the moment. So. You know, for me, obviously, you know, going to Europe at a young age and even now, you know, playing in the A-League, you still got to, you know, be on top of that. You know, for me, what I do off the field and away from training is, is just as important as what I do, you know, when I turn up to training and the games because, you know, without that, you, you won't be able to sustain that level and compete at that level. Fantastic, guys. Um, Steve, you wanted to say something. I almost cut you off. Uh, I'll jump in with yeah, one more question. I guess we're nearly yep. out of time. So thank you both for your time, Adrian and Steve. Um, how's the rest of the season looking at Western United, Steve? Obviously, you've finished up your games in Victoria and you're on the road to Tassie to play in Lonnie for a couple of games, then a couple of more interstate trips as well for away matches. Uh, we hope we'll see you back in uh, in Melbourne playing uh, playing a home final after all of that. But uh, how's it all shaping up with those upcoming fixtures uh, starting against uh, Perth there as we see on the screen now? Yeah, we're obviously travelling to Tasmania now. We, we're going to be there for a week. And we've got two games there. And yeah, look, there's five games left. You know, we're still in a really good position. You know, we, we've done really well this season. And obviously now, you know, it's coming to the, to the end of the season. And, you know, we want to obviously... Um, Finish strongly, you know, every game's important now. You see how close Melbourne City, um, you know, even victory now is coming strong. Melbourne City, they're, they're a quality team, you know. So it's so close to the league, so close to so many um, good teams. Every game's hard in this league, you know, there's no easy game. So, you know, we've really had to stay focused every game to to, 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 to sort of stay at the top there. Um, otherwise, you sort of fall back pretty quickly with a few few bad results in the A-League. You, you suddenly go down the table. So, yeah, look, we're obviously looking forward to our trip to Tasmania. Um, we've got two hard games there. And then, you know, I think we've got a trip away to New South Wales. We've got a few games there as well. And then before you know it, um, the finals will be there. So, look, we're obviously taking it game by game and definitely going to be ready for, for, for the game against Perth. 
Oh, gentlemen, thank you so much for being a part of tonight's show. It's, it's the, the pearls of wisdom um, that we were, you're able to share with a lot of um, our Geelong-based uh, younger players, and we do have some quality, quality juniors coming through the ranks. And um, one of those I saw in action on the weekend, 16-year-old Noah Skoko, son of Yossip Skoko, playing for North Geelong in the senior team. He's a, he's a kid with a lot of potential, and there's quite a fair few of those kids as well in action. So uh, uh, that's the um, the holiday camp there. Once again, April 20, 21st and 22nd. That's next Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Lots of room for the age three to six group. Um, that's from 9am till 10am. And then we've got the um, sevens to 16s. They're going to be from 10.30 to 1.30. They're at Geelong College. Absolutely beautiful grounds there. And um, we look forward to uh, hearing some good reports coming from that. Um, Stephen, wishing you all the very best with, with Western United. And once again, thank you so, so much for uh, for uh, coming on the Geelong Region Soccer Show. And um, Adrian, all the very best with your new Venture Curva coaching. And uh, hopefully we'll um, we'll see it expand and grow and, um, and, and be here for many, many years to come. Thanks, gents. Thanks for having me on. And uh, I might send Stephen you top. We can't have that top on here anymore. <laughs> I didn't plan that out very well, did I? It was pretty no, no, no. It's, it's been hurt me for an hour, so I needed to say something. We are looking for apparel <laughs> sponsors, actually. So, uh, well, you know, Adidas probably would, would sit, look a lot better on, on Steve there. <laughs> Ado, thank you so much. Steve, thank you so much. And I uh, wish you all the very best for the, uh, for, for, for see, the foreseeable future. Thanks, guys. No worries. Thanks, guys. Good Thanks, day, guys. Yeah. Oh, mate, you've gone a bit red there, Steve. 